hello everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, so the talk that I'm sharing with you is um, titled Using Machine Learning for Climate Science. And so essentially we are starting to apply machine learning in different capacities to different questions of climate, including climate variability and climate prediction. Um, and so some of these new applications are really exciting. And, um, and so I'm going to be sharing with you today some ongoing work. Um, and so um, the work that I'm sharing with you today was funded or is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and so a key component of the work lies in using machine learning to understand the predictability of large scale climate patterns and modes of variability. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work, which include other scientists at NCAR or the National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, but also several um, students that are currently enrolled in the um, university, uh, in the Colorado State University. Um, and one of them is a postdoc as well, that's Zane. Um, okay, so we know that data availability has grown thanks to the internet and web users. Um, we also have a lot of new um, instruments on satellites that um, are at unprecedented resolution and they really um, provide us with a lot of data. Um, and so this data is very large, high quality uh, data. Um, and as far as images from um, the internet, um, there, those images have been used to create large data sets such as one called ImageNet. Um, and so that data set was actually created by a group at Stanford University um, several years ago now. Um, and so their effort was to take all these images of cats and dogs and, and bicycles, et cetera, and um, build this um, data set that was um, labeled um, that would help us um, training these uh, data hungry models. Um, but to briefly give a first a broader overview of what um, machine learning is. Um, so we know that machine learning was a subfield of artificial intelligence, and it's actually not a new concept. It was coined um, back in the late 1950s by Arthur Lee Samuel, who was a computer scientist and pioneer in machine learning. And so this person defined uh, machine learning as the ability of computers to learn from data. Um, now, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which specifically consists of models that use artificial neural networks and are typically of several layers deep. Um, and so this is really how that hierarchy of um, concepts around artificial intelligence and machine learning um, stack up. Um, and we do know that recent advances in machine learning and deep learning specifically can be leveraged to understand Earth system science and, in my case, climate variability and predictability. Um, so we have, again, a lot of data that is available for us to use to train these very data-hungry models. Um, there's also been a lot of hardware development that has really enabled us to train um, larger and larger machine learning models uh, that are much more accurate. And so that includes things like GPUs, um, which are certain computing um, uh, chips that go into, let's say, a supercomputer or even your laptop computer um, and enable much faster computations. And so that's really enabled uh, the building of these deeper models. Um, and of course, in machine learning, uh, while machine learning is not new, there have been several new advances in terms of new algorithms and, um, and also training um, and let's say activation functions that we use in, during the training process for some of these layers as we're training. And so that's really also made things a lot more accurate. So it's really this sort of trifecta of um, things coming together that have made machine learning so powerful and, um, and, and something that could really be taken advantage of uh, to improve our understanding of Earth system science. Um, and so a brief history of machine learning. So again, it is uh, not a new field. It has a really long and rich history. 
Um, we know that the 1950s and 1980s saw a lot of excitement in the field of machine learning, including the development of key terms and algorithms. Um, in the 1950s, for example, there was a development of something called the perceptron algorithm. Um, and this was a precursor to modern neural networks. Um, so we're really starting to see that sort of development way back in the 50s. Um, and um, also in the 80s, we saw the development of the backpropagation algorithm, uh, which allowed for the um, training of multi-layered models and improved parameter optimization. Um, and so this is um, something that we use even today um, for training some of these models that have multiple layers um, in with them. Um, and so these advances also had um, periods of disappointment in the um, timeline of machine learning. Um, and these are usually referred to as AI winters. Um, and so the 1970s about, and also late 80s and 1990s um, were cat basically can be described as AI winters. Um, and so essentially there was just disappointment and reduced funding for the field. Um, and um, there was just skepticism as far as the field's progress and the limited technology really um, limited the ability of these models. Um, but more recently, we've seen more activity and are currently where we are now. Um, and so um, the development of deep convolutional neural networks have occurred over the last um, decade or, or two decades or so. Um, and so there were several key developments here in the last several years. Um, one of them was that ImageNet database that I briefly mentioned on the first slide. Um, and so that database was worked on for several years by a group at Stanford University in the 2000s. And it was a groundbreaking data set because it consisted of over 14 million high quality labeled images for over 22,000 categories. And so that made it ideal for training these models that are not only data hungry, but really need um, some label data sets that are uh, of high quality that, that have been quality controlled. Um, and so that's exactly what this data set provided at least in a supervised learning framework where we know what the answer is. Um, and so the objective of this data set um, became to benchmark model development. Um, and so as new machine learning models were being created, um, having one data set that could be used across institutions and by different groups uh, to benchmark their models is really useful. Um, and so this also helped overcome challenges with model overfitting, where models would just memorize a data set and not really be um, actually learning to generalize, meaning learning to um, predict with unseen data. Um, and so this then led to the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge. Um, and so now there was a challenge that was created using this very large data set for different groups to come in and train machine learning models and compete um, and see who could um, get the best performance um, in predicting some of these categories of um, and, and predicting what was in the images. So, for example, if you have maybe seen before an, an image of a cat or a dog, and so these models would essentially tell you whether the image was one of a cat or a dog, um, and so that sort of thing. Um, and so in 2012, there was something significant that happened at this contest um, or this challenge, um, and it was at a specific model one. Um, and it was a really large drop in error that was recorded that year by the winning model. And that model was a convolutional neural network. Um, and so essentially these models allow you to learn spatial characteristics of your data set. Um, and what was so significant about the model was that it was several layers deep. And so it, it was a large, uh, model. Um, and so that really demonstrated that, you know, as we add more and more layers, we can actually achieve very good performance. Um, and um, from the history of machine learning, we know that convolutional neural networks have been around for quite some time. Um, we've actually seen developments back in the late 
uh, 19, like 1998. Um, but because of several key recent innovations, like I mentioned in the first slide, one being GPUs to have helped expand the size of the machine learning models um, by accelerating computation, more data, and, um, and, and just the advan continued advancement of these algorithms has really brought machine learning to where it is today. Um, and so it's, it's a, a really exciting time to be using machine learning. Um, and we've seen several key innovations or advancements in industry, but we're hoping to continue to see these advancements now in earth system science for discovery um, and, uh, and, and to help society. Um, so I wanted to highlight um, uh, programming languages because um, in machine learning and, um, and I guess a recent trend overall um, in the earth system sciences is the popularity of a computer uh, language called Python. Um, and so we can actually, I guess why Python is significant is because it's an open source software and, um, and we've also seen a lot of sharing of code using that. And there's um, platforms such as one called Stack Overflow where uh, programmers can communicate with each other. Also GitHub where people can code together. Um, and so Python has really kind of um, been the language that's been used for a lot of machine learning um, programs that are open source. And, um, and that's actually also really helped with machine learning as well, because let's say an earth system scientist that's not trained in computer science or in machine learning, but uses Python can now go and look at um, machine learning code that's available online and interact with um, coders in industry and, um, and, and then take their algorithms and apply it to earth system science. Again, because of this open source nature of um, the Python language. And so I think because at least in part, because of these reasons, um, we've seen the explosion of its use and popularity and, um, and just really is enabling science. Um, and so here we're visualizing a Stack Overflow Trends tool um, and so Stack Overflow itself, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a question and answer website for computer programmers where programmers can learn from each other. Essentially, I can go on this website and post a question. I can say, you know, I'm having this error and I don't know why this is happening. And then someone else can come in and, and, and try to answer my question. And what's nice about it is that people also get points um, and, and like a reputation um, status. Um, so the more questions they answer correctly, the higher their status goes on this website. Um, but it's, and there's, it's just basically this network of computer programmers. Um, but the website contains a registered user base of over 10 million people. Um, so that's quite substantial. And, and that really um, makes the answering of these questions much quicker uh, than if it was just, let's say, one specific company or, or a group at a laboratory that has, you know, limited capacity. Um, and people ask about 8,000 questions per day. Um, so it is very active. Um, but at Stack Overflow, they developed this, this tool called Trends, um, where you can see um, just basically the trend in um, computer languages that are being asked by people. Um, and so you can see that back in the, in like, let's say 2009, um, Python was not as popular, uh, but over the years, it's really exploded in popularity. And as of the last couple of years, most of the questions or a larger percentage of questions being asked on this website are uh, on, on Python. Um, so this just illustrates its growth in popularity. And um, like I mentioned, a lot of these machine learning software uh, tools and, um, and tutorials that are freely available online have been written in Python. Um, and so we have a very active community that uses Python, lots of tools in machine learning um, that are written in Python. And so you just kind of have this ecosystem that is self-sustaining and um, supporting itself. Um, so some of these software tools were actually um, developed in industry. So for example, PyTorch was developed at Facebook. Um, and we know that um, Keras and TensorFlow were developed at Google. 
Um, and so these open source software packages have also many detailed tutorials that go along with them. I myself have used them quite a bit, and um, that's made AI more accessible to the broader community. Um, and so many of these open source libraries and packages for deep learning have been written in Python. Um, and so this really has created, again, this positive feedback loop and self-sustaining ecosystem that really can be leveraged to apply deep learning models to earth system science problems. Um, so we're leveraging not only uh, machine learning packages that have been written in Python, but also many pre-existing packages for earth science that were written in Python that can just be incorporated into the same environment. Um, and so again, just really helping accelerate this um, progress and, um, and, and discovery in earth system science. Um, and so now I'll proceed to the um, to the science. Um, so I'm going to share research from two different projects. Uh, this first project is on really long term scales in climate. Um, and in fact, we're looking at the Atlantic Meridiano overturning circulation, which has been in the news um, quite a bit recently, uh, at least back in February, from what I remember. Um, and so the Atlantic Meridiano overturning circulation is a large scale ocean circulation that redistributes heat from low to high latitudes. And so we actually have deep water formation that forms up here in the North Atlantic and then goes really deep into um, the ocean. And, um, and this really helps redistribute heat around the globe. Um, so it's really important for Earth's climate. Uh, we know that the influence of, of AMOC, as it's called, extends to North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, um, and it can even influence um, climate patterns across um, other ocean basins. Uh, so, for example, it influences the El Nino Southern Oscillation in the Pacific. Um, so, again, its influence is really global. Um, we know that an overturning circulation or deep water formation is absent um, in the present day North Pacific. Uh, so we're only seeing deep water formation really occurring in the North Atlantic, not in the North Pacific. Um, but there's been other studies that have looked at, let's say, like paleo, uh, paleo climate data and, um, and have found that in the past, there actually was an overturning circulation or deep water formation occurring in the North Pacific. Um, and some studies have hypothesized that there is an asynchronous like relationship between the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, uh, where if deep water formation is happening in one basin, it's not in the other. Um, but then if one slows down, it might trigger deep water formation in the other one. Um, so there's a seesaw like relationship that people have hypothesized exists. Um, and we know that because of climate change or global warming, um, the Atlantic Meridiano overturning circulation is projected to weaken. Uh, there's still a lot of debate as far as whether um, the observational record is long enough uh, for us to really determine that um, on the accuracy of climate models. Um, but overall, it seems like the signal really is consistent um, for us to uh, be seeing that we're seeing a slowdown in uh, AMOC which again is of concern because of its influence around the globe um, and to different climates globally. Um, and so because we don't know um, how, you know, because um, AMOC might be slowing down, um, it's possible that PMOC or the North Pacific deep water formation might develop based on that seesaw-like relationship. Um, since we don't, um, yeah, so if that were to occur, um, it's possible that we might be seeing many modulations or changes to sea surface temperatures around the globe and also the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, and so basically the purpose of the study that I'm going to be sharing with you was um, to analyze what would happen to sea surface temperatures around the globe and also the El Nino Southern Oscillation if um, we were to see a slowdown 
of, um, of the AMOC and if we were to see a development of deep water formation in the North Pacific. Uh, what we did to explore this was we created a uh, multi-centennial um, climate simulations that spanned about 800 years. Um, and we use this with, um, we created this using a global climate model that was developed here at NCAR along with the com broader scientific community. And um, essentially we, um, what we did was run an experiment where we explored what would happen to global sea surface temperatures if um, the circulations were to be in different states. So let's say if one were to collapse and another one were to activate or uh, vice versa. Um, and so this is again a global climate model. And um, here we're visualizing sea surface temperatures. We can see that sea surface temperatures um, in the mean, if we're just looking at um, like the yearly average are warmer across the tropics as one would hope um, and cooler across um, higher latitudes in the north and, um, and, and southern in the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, these little arrows show wind stress or, or just the general direction of wind um, near the surface. And um, yeah, and then on the right here, I'm showing you a um, plot of a fast Fourier transform um, that was run on this sea surface temperature data. And uh, a forward fast Fourier transform is actually, you know, it's not unique to climate science at all. Um, it's used in, in many applications uh, from sound uh, processing um, to image processing. Um, but here we use it just to look at how um, the temperature is fluctuating over time. Um, and we we're doing this essentially because we're interested in seeing what the dominant signal is um, from sea surface temperatures. And, and this converts time variance to frequency variance um, data. And essentially, you know, if I were to really simplify this analysis, what we're seeing here in this sort of pink shading in, in most places around the globe is that the annual cycle is a dominant signal for sea surface temperatures, which makes sense, right? So throughout the year, we see temperatures warming during summer and cooling during winter. Um, and so what this is saying is that overall, for most locations, you see that consistent signal. So just like one cycle per year. Um, there are a few locations in the tropics where actually that's not the case, where we might have two, um, two cycles in a year. And that's because the sun crosses the equator twice um, in, in the year. Um, and we also have some slower uh, frequencies in there, and that could be associated with the El Nino Southern Oscillation out in the West Pacific. Um, so the El Nino Southern Oscillation really occurs out here, but some of these waves that propagate um, could actually influence frequencies out here near the maritime continent. Um, so that's essentially all we're looking at here. Most areas, we know that the dominant signal is the annual cycle. And then when we run our experiments, um, so here we're visualizing um, what would happen if the AMOC collapses. And um, this is AMOC collapsing and, um, yeah, and, and PMOC not being active. So we don't have deep water formation in either the Atlantic or Pacific. Um, and so what we end up seeing is something pretty shocking, but that is well known in the climate literature um, because these experiments have been done before. And that is that um, we see overall cooling across the northern hemisphere uh, and pretty substantial across the North Atlantic. Um, so here we're not really seeing that redistribution globally of warmer uh, waters from the tropics moving northward. Um, and so we end up really with really cold sea surface temperatures out across um, northern latitudes in the northern hemisphere. Um, and interestingly, we see overall warmer temperatures in the southern hemisphere as a result of the shutdown of um, these circulations. And it's really just because, again, we're not redistributing um, this heat globally. And so it just kind of sits there in certain areas. Um, we also see substantial changes to winds globally. 
um, we end up not really seeing, um, yeah, we see just significant changes in where winds are uh, blowing from or to. Um, and so that also influences um, climates um, across the globe. Um, and so here again, we're looking at this. Um, so the fast Fourier, Fourier transform, and um, and now we're gonna. I'm gonna show you a wavelet analysis. Um, these are signal processing techniques. Uh, so not really machine learning, but um, just still very valuable techniques within um, within climate science. And um, the analysis that I'm sharing with you next is called the wavelet analysis. Um, and so the reason for this uh, or this analysis being used here is that a challenge with the fa applying a forward fast Fourier transform um, is that you end up losing that time series information. So you don't see how frequency changes over time as a result of, let's say, the AMOC collapsing. Um, and so that's a limitation with the spectral analysis is that, again, we have a loss of temporal information. Uh, so the wavelet analysis, what we end up doing is we just um, use a, a kind of arbitrarily chosen wavelet. Here I'm using this one called the Morlet wavelet. Um, I did test several different ones, but, um, but use this one uh, because of the resolution of the data. And so we just kind of pass this throughout the time series and are able to extract signals from our time series data to see what the dominant frequencies are um, over time and, and how those are changing. And so it, it's really useful for that. And so um, here I'm going to show you the results from the um, wavelet analysis and what this looks like. Um, so if we run it on our control, so this is just the climate um, before um, climate change and, and just a very stable climate of, um, of the planet, just very global climate that's very stable and consistent. Um, and so if we run this wavelet analysis throughout the 800 year simulation of a very stable global climate, we see that patterns are consistent overall, right? Uh, there's some variations out here in the periods two to seven, which you could think of as years two to seven. Uh, and so this is associated with El Nino and La Nina because these are just oscillations that occur every couple of years. Um, but over here, if you look at one, which is, again, the annual cycle or just one year, we see a very consistent signal on sea surface temperatures across the tropical Pacific, right? So that means that the annual cycle is the dominant signal. Um, but then if we look at, um, at our experiments, specifically the one where AMOC collapsed and PMOC is also collapsed, um, and we run this wavelet analysis, um, we know that AMOC collapsed at about year 100 or 200. Uh, we end up seeing that the annual cycle disappears um, from this time series. And actually that ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation gets amplified. So this means that in this hypothetical future climate where AMOC has collapsed um, because, and there's just no more deep water formation in the North Atlantic, uh, the tropical Pacific would also see significant changes. We would see a really substantial amplification of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, meaning El Nino and La Nina would be much stronger than they are today. And of course, that would lead to significant changes um, to regional climates and, and really bring about um, even more extremes um, because of the teleconnections between El Nino and La Nina and the global climate. Um, and of course, that's on top of the already extremes based on our um, uh, on the global sea surface temperature changes happening because we're not seeing that redistribution of heat. Um, and so what, the next question is why? What was the chain of events that um, occurred um, to make, yeah, to really lead to the sea surface temperatures changing, right? Uh, or at least specifically to the tropical Pacific. If we're seeing changes in the North Atlantic, how is it that that's changing the tropical Pacific uh, when that's so far away, a, a completely different basin that's not even, you know, it, it's only connected through the Drake Passage, which is obviously really far away in, in, off the tip of South America. Um, and so one way is to create these causal graphs uh, where we 
you know, plot out what we have seen um, in our simulations, what are the effects of certain things happening, and we can connect them. Um, and so some future work that I have planned is to assess causal relationships um, using causal effect networks or, uh, or perhaps um, something a bit simpler like ranger causality, uh, where we can essentially just test if indeed this chain of events is as we think it is. Um, and so that's some future work that's planned. But what's really neat about these causal effect networks is that we are able to quantify how much of an impact a certain, um, yeah, we can quantify this pathway <clears throat> and really confirm whether or not what we're thinking is correct. Um, and so to conclude for the first um, research topic, Again, we uh, saw that when the AMOC collapses, we see some pretty substantial changes to the tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures. And we really see an amplification or strengthening of El Nino and La Nina, uh, which have teleconnections globally. Um, and now I'll share with you a machine learning project um, applied to climate variability. Uh, and so now we're looking at our current climate. Um, and so we're looking at much shorter time scales, uh, which are still not weather time scales, but we're looking at uh, subseasonal time scales. And subseasonal time scales are time scales of approximately three to four weeks or so. So less than seasonal, um, so less than two months. Um, and so what is machine learning anyway? Um, I, I assume if you're here, you're wondering or, or likely already know, um, but we know that with machine learning methods, um, we explicitly provide a specific set of instructions for a computer to follow. Um, so we would tell it perhaps some um, decisions based on our own research or experience. Um, and we would tell it, okay, if you see this in your data, do this. If you see this other thing, then do this other thing. Um, and so with these very specific instructions for a computer, it just follows these and is able to do this much faster than we are. And so that's really the advantage there. Uh, but with machine learning, um, we simply provide the data and allow the computer to learn from the data using some of these um, neural networks or different architectures and, and loss functions that we end up um, setting the um, optimization task for. Um, and so really what's advantageous here is that it's able to just kind of learn from the data and, and we can actually perform knowledge discovery um, using um, what the machine learning algorithm or model has learned from our data. Um, and so the artificial neural network architecture that I'm sharing with you here um, is, uh, they're called self-ordered organizing maps, and these have been around for some time as well. They're not particularly new. Um, but what's neat about self-organizing maps is that it's an automatic data analysis method or just unsupervised learning. So earlier I discussed the image that data set, which um, had labels to them. You know, if it was a photo of a dog, then its label was dog. Um, and, and so you would train the model by giving it the photo of the dog and then telling it it's a dog. Um, with unsupervised learning, we don't have labels. We just have the data. And so we give our machine learning model the data and we allow it to perform some sort of clustering or grouping of the data based on what it thinks are similar. Um, and so that's the um, algorithm that I ended up using um, here. And um, we know that it's widely applied to different problems in other um, industries, not in or system science specifically, like industry, like um, finance, natural sciences, or linguistics. Um, and it's actually been really used a lot in the management of massive text databases and also bioinformatics. Um, we know that um, basically it just ends up, again, grouping data that looks similar to each other. Um, and so what I ended up doing in this application was I took simulations that were created using the community Earth system model. So this global climate model that was also used in the first study in this talk. Um, but here what we ended up doing was we um, use as input observations 
And then we made predictions out to 46 days or 45 days. Um, and so the objective was to see if we can predict um, precipitation or temperature signals um, globally, but here I'm just sharing results from the United States um, with some skill. Um, and so with subseasonal forecasting, there's an idea that perhaps some of these patterns might be um, predictable um, out to several weeks. And that could really help um, with emergency management, you know, if there's a potential risk for extremes within that pattern. Um, it's also possible that, um, that we could just really help with resource management. Um, so let's say like managing water, uh, if we know it's going to be a really dry period in two to three or four weeks, um, there could be some reallocation of resources uh, to try to help with that and, and mitigate some of those potential issues. Um, and so that's really the objective with subseasonal forecasting. Um, and so what I ended up doing was I gave this machine learning model just several variables. And I said, I, you know, I want to look at synoptic scale regimes over the United States. Um, can you group these patterns together for me? And this plot shows um, geopotential height at 500 millibars, which is approximately like the you can think of as like the center of the vertical profile of the atmosphere. And, um, and, and so negative areas suggest more stormy like weather or just lower pressure. Um, and the red areas sig uh, signify higher pressure. Um, so maybe clearer skies. Again, these are just very broad generalizations. Um, and so the self-organizing map that I trained is a three by three map. Um, and we can create composites of what this machine learning model thinks these different synoptic scale regimes look like. Um, and so we can see that the patterns are quite different. Um, and it, I plotted the sample sizes here. And so we see it thinks like 38 of the examples it saw fit, fit under this um, category, uh, 56 fit under this other category. Um, and so this is really neat. It can help us make sense of some of this data uh, because it's a lot of data to go through and we might miss um, some of the similarities in these examples and things like that. Um, we also could visualize what precipitation looks like um, in these different patterns. Um, so again, here's our three by three self-organizing map. Green areas are areas of higher precipitation. Brown areas of, are areas of lower precipitation or drier conditions. Um, and these vectors show winds at higher levels in the atmosphere. So approximately where the jet stream uh, flows. And so we can see overall some cyclonic uh, rotation in other areas, anti-cyclonic. And, uh, and just, again, um, seeing these very... Um, distinct synoptic scale regimes. Something that's neat that we can do with this method is that while these maps were created using week three, we can then extract week one um, and look in the tropics to see if there's signals preceding these uh, week three, week four forecasts. Um, and, and that maybe perhaps could give us some predictability. So here we're looking at outgoing long wave radiation. Um, essentially, the objective of looking at this variable is that there's an oscillation called the Madden-Julian oscillation um, in the tropics, and it's just convection signals that propagate at approximately 30 to 60 days or so across the globe. And these have teleconnections to global weather patterns as well. Um, and so here we're seeing a very distinct signal across the tropical Pacific, which could have implications for this specific synoptic scale regime. Um, and then here in the bottom, we're seeing a very different looking pattern across the tropics, again, uh, associated with a different type of synoptic scale regime. Likewise, we can look at other variables. So here we're seeing sea surface temperature anomalies across um, a, a larger section of the globe. So this is the entire Pacific, this is the Atlantic, and out here farther west, we're looking at the Indian Ocean. And again, we have anomalies that are very distinct for different synoptic scale regimes. So this suggests that if we see this sort of pattern across the Pacific, perhaps uh, we might have a higher chance of seeing this synoptic scale regime two weeks later. 
Something else that we can do with this method is we can look at errors in our global climate model. Um, so we can actually say, okay, now let's compare the global climate model predictions to observations, um, because many of these are hindcasts or were for past events that we already saw. Um, and so we can actually end up running our self-organizing maps on these errors and creating error regimes um, where we're seeing very similar type errors. And we can actually then go ahead and again, extract our upstream patterns. Um, so these errors are for week three. Here we're looking at week one, and we can try to figure out where these errors are coming from. What are the weather patterns or, or climate regimes that are, we're seeing across, let's say the tropics, preceding uh, these um, week three errors. Um, and so here we have a very distinct signal across the tropical Pacific. And likewise, for this other error regime, we see a very different pattern. Uh, so this suggests that some of these patterns that we're seeing out here could be related to, um, to these errors that we're seeing in our, in our forecasts. Um, likewise, we can look at other variables such as sea surface temperatures. Um, and so the next work that's planned is to train a convolutional neural network to predict these synoptic scale regimes using some of these input variables. Um, and what's neat about um, these methods is that we can then also perform explainability or interpretability, and we can generate heat maps uh, from these um, predictions and, and the input variables that show us what areas this convolutional neural network is looking at um, to predict um, some of the synoptic scale regimes. Um, and so again, this helps us further quantify or understand what, what um, processes or mechanisms in the climate system are important for um, certain predictions. Um, and these are some questions that I have for myself. Um, uh, you know, I'm wondering about what happens when we have extremes or very much um, some outlier events. Um, you know, do, do self-organizing maps pick those out as well? Um, or do they get ignored? Um, and, um, and also wondering about if we were to train a convolutional network using a uh, temporal component of our input data. Um, could that lead to improved skill or improved understanding? Um, and with that, I am done. <laughs> thanks, um, everyone. And, and Jim, I'll toss it back over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Mooney. We do have some questions here in the chat. Uh, so first off, can you talk a little bit more about what is a deep water formation? What is a deep water oscillation? Uh, talk a little bit about that, please. So essentially deep water formation is, um, so here we're looking at the Gulf Stream current, which is really warm water. And as it flows northward, it gets cooler. Um, and then as it gets cooler, it, it starts to get denser. Um, and there's a separation that happens between really salty water and just fresh water as it's moving northward. And the salty water is more dense um, and ends up actually sinking because of, uh, of this. Um, and so this process is important because again, it's circulating water globally as this deep water, as this um, salty water sinks deep into uh, the ocean. And then actually there's deep water currents. So this water flows very slowly, but, um, but it does flow um, at deeper depths of the ocean and, and then moves southward. Um, so we have, you know, it's a 3D volume of water and you're having um, currents at the surface flowing one way and, and could be very different at deeper depths. Um, so that's really what's happening out here in uh, the North Atlantic in, in very simple, um, quick uh, terms. I'm sure it's much more complicated. <laughs> okay. How long do experiments take these wavelet analysis? I mean, how long would that take now with machine learning versus how long it would have taken uh, before these kinds of tools existed? Hmm. I'm not quite sure how long it would have taken before these tools existed. Uh, but for me, I can run all these analyses in one day, like less than a day. Yeah, just a couple hours. And, and, and I mean, all the different variations. It takes me longer to code it than it takes a computer to run it. Wow, so it's really 
probably speeded things up quite a bit then. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm not seeing anything else pop up in the chat. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and shut it down for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Maria Molina, for joining us today and helping us discover more about our world. Please join us next week for the Voice of Women Veterans. That's presented by Dr. Tara Golovsky. She is the National Center for PTSD Women's Health Sciences Division Director. She is Boston University Associate Professor and the Director of the Women Veterans Network. Uh, so you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for coming.